Hi, I'm Rowan Williams, author of The Lion's World, and you're listening to Pints with Jack. If there's life on other planets, then I'm sure that he must know, and he's been there once already, and has died to save their souls. This is Pints with Jack, Season 6, Episode 49. Astrophysics and Cosmic Salvation. After Hours with Jimmy Aiken. Welcome everyone. Here on Pints with Jack, we are reading our way through the works of C.S. Lewis. And this season, we've read through the first of Lewis's science fiction trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet. And in this work, as we've discussed, Lewis imagines life on Mars, and he asks, what would a species untouched by sin, or at least relatively untouched by sin, what would that look like? How would they relate to God? And most importantly, would Jesus need to go to that planet as well? And the opening quotation for this episode was a lyric from the song UFO by Larry Norman, and he offers one possible answer. But in today's show, we're going to be digging into these in greater depth, looking at these theological questions regarding alien life. And we're doing that with the perfect guest for this subject matter, apologist and science fiction nerd, Jimmy Aiken. Jimmy Aiken is a senior apologist at Catholic Answers and the author of many books such as The Fathers Know Best and The Drama of Salvation. He's a weekly guest on the radio show Catholic Answers Live, and he's the host of podcasts too numerous to mention, but I'll mention a few. (laughs) A Daily Defense, The Secrets of Star Wars, The Secrets of Star Trek, and of course, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. And he's recently returned to his home state of Arkansas, where Dick Devine assures me that he has Einstein on toast and drinks a pint of Klingon blood wine for breakfast. Jimmy Aiken, welcome back to Pints with Jack. Well, thank you so much, David. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, It's not true that I have Einstein on toast, because that would be cannibalism, and I don't drink a a pint of Klingon blood wine for breakfast because I don't do breakfast. I do intermittent fasting. (laughs) Say, Dick Devine. But I appreciate the spirit. (laughs) Tell me, how's it been moving back to your home state? Because that was a recent move for you. Yeah, it's been great. Um, I'm very happy to be back in my hometown, which is uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, I was in California for 30 years, and while California is a geographically beautiful state, it's also evil, and it got more evil over time, so I'm very glad to be back home. Well, well done for joining the winning team of all of us who fled California. (laughs) But you're right, it is very pretty, so we're probably due for a vacation back there at some point soon. Oh, sure. Probably probably during the winter when the weather here is awful. (laughs) Hmm. And I'll be going back to California as well for work events and things like that. Mm. Well, ideally, of course, we should be drinking Klingon blood wine for today's toast. But as you say, you do intermittent fasting, so we're not going to do that. Um, I'm instead drinking some alien amber ale. Uh, Do you have anything to wet your whistle beside a pipe? Uh, I have Diet Dr. Pepper. So that's what I'm doing right now. Also, I have grapefruit citrus zevia. Well, today I am wearing my very fashionable Because It's Aliens t-shirt from your podcast, Jimmy Aiken's Mm -hmm. Mysterious World. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) And I'm going to be giving away one of these t-shirts to a randomly selected listener. And if people would like to enter, all they have to do is share this link on social media and tag Pints with Jack. So with that, let's toast in Cleon, Iwilij Jack Charge. Iwilij Jack Charge. Which means, may your blood burn. Common Klingon toast. <laughs> exactly. I actually thought it was, may your blood burn in hell. Either way, it's, it's no very mention cheery. of hell. You is, oh, I, can, I could pull it apart, but I might get a little bit of it wrong. But basically, you've got the verb out of a usual Klingon order at the end. But uh, if I recall correctly, you means blood and lige means mm, your uh, jach or jach means uh, burn and judge means may. Well, there you go. <laughs> if I recall you, correctly. The fact that you could break that down shouldn't surprise me, yet it still does. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that it, you really needed any more proof at this point, but 
Would you mind just telling us a little bit about your love of science fiction and also science more generally? Yeah, well, I, I have an interest in both. Um, it may not come as a surprise, but when I was a boy, Mr. Spock was my role model. And so <laughs> that combined both science and science fiction. Um, I study science on the regular. Um, I read science books for fun and, you know, just to acquire general background and keep up with the state of things. Um, <clears throat> the most recent book I, I read was on... Um, uh, new discoveries, new research that's been done about the human senses and how they are not as limited as has often been thought. Um, for example, our sense of smell is not really that is not really inferior to that of dogs. It turns out that that's a myth based on the idea that the part of our brain that processes smells is a lot has a lot less neurons than a dog's brain, but that's not true. And it turns out that we're better at sensing some smells that dogs than dogs are, whereas dogs are better at sensing other smells than we are. So we're actually kind of even with dogs. And there's even been research that has shown that um, humans are capable of responding to a single photon of light with vision. Although there's a question about that I've heard raised, and it occurred to me too when I read it, are they really sensing the light with vision or are they detecting it through extrasensory perception? And both of those would be possibilities. You'd have to set up an experiment in a very carefully controlled way to exclude the possibility of extrasensory perception and show you're really getting a single photon through your rods and cones. Um, so, you know, that's just an illustration. I also uh, read science channels, uh, you know, aggregators. There's one I check every day to see what the latest science news is. I watch different science channels on YouTube. And I'm always, you know, trying to learn more about the mechanics of the world that God created for us. I'm also interested in science fiction. I have been since I was a kid. Uh, Star Trek was one of my favorite shows growing up. I watched it in syndication. Um, and I continue to read science fiction and watch science fiction, and I have different authors that I, uh, that I prefer. I don't have as much of a chance to read it these days as some other folks do, or watch it as much as some other folks do, because I've got a lot of other activities going on. But uh, I do enjoy it, and I do keep up with it. I'm even on two weekly podcasts that deal with science fiction. One of them is Secrets of Star Trek. The other is Secrets of Doctor Who. And providentially enough, today I was listening to your Daily Defense, which is the podcast mm -hmm. uh, serialization of, of your book on mm -hmm. how to become a better apologist. Today, it was an argument for God from quantum mechanics. So oh, yeah. people, might, people might wonder, well, what is the use of all of this stuff for defending the faith? Turns out quite a bit. Yeah, there's also uh, one entry in a Daily Defense. So that's a 365-day book where on each for each day of the year... I um, take up an objection to either the Catholic understanding of the Christian faith or the Christian faith in general or even just faith in general. And I even quote an episode of Star Trek in one of them uh, where uh, Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock are having a um, conversation about approximations of accuracy because, you know, Mr. Spock likes to give very, very precise estimations. <laughs> Well, let's move on. Back when sure. my wife, Marie, worked for you at Catholic Answers, she came back from work one day and told me that you had made a comment about the scientific mistakes in Out of the Silent Planet. Mm -hmm. So immediately I was angry, and then I realized Aww. I needed to get over that because if Jimmy Aiken thinks that something about science is wrong, it's probably wrong. So now that we've all enjoyed this book so much going through it this season, mm -hmm. what did Lewis get wrong? Well, your memory of it and your listeners' memory of it is going to be better than mine because I read Out of the Silent Planet quite a number of years ago, and so my memory is not fresh on the subject. But I understand, you know, some of the liberties that Lewis took um, scientifically were things he knew he was taking. For example, he presents Mars or Malacandra um, as having an oxygen-rich atmosphere, and he knew that that was not the case. Um, you know, he, he knew that astronomy had pretty well determined by when he wrote the book that Mars really doesn't have a lot of oxygen in its atmosphere, but it, but he needed ransom to breathe. 
So he, yes. he, he, took, he took a liberty and gave it an oxygen-rich atmosphere. He also borrowed on ideas that were in the zeitgeist of the time about Mars, like in the 19th century, one of the prominent ideas, uh, and here in America this was popularized by Percival Lowell, who, you know, founded uh, the, uh, the Astronomical Observatory at Flagstaff, Arizona. But Percival Lowell was also very interested in Mars, and like a number of people at the time, um, he thought that there was a civilization on Mars that had built these canals that were visible from Earth. And it turns out this was based in part, I mean, you could see some lines on the surface of Mars sometimes, and an Italian astronomer had described them using the word canali, which means channel, but it got translated into English as canal. And so you had this idea in, in, in the zeitgeist that Mars had a civilization, maybe a dying civilization, that was using canals to route water from you know the polar regions to the equatorial regions and to support farming and and help the population to live and and this was a very popular idea it was uh, for some time it was regularly discussed in popular articles and books about mars uh, percival lowell was a big fan of it and by the time that lewis wrote um out of the silent planet it, it was they pretty well knew these aren't really canals um, you know, like one of them is the biggest valley in the solar system, um, which is just, it's enormous. It's, it's absolutely huge, but it looks like a line, you know, from the distance we're at. And some people thought, okay, this is, this is a canal. Um, Lewis knew that wasn't true, but because it was part of the zeitgeist, he used it anyway. And, mm -hmm. and that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. He also commented in a letter he wrote, um, uh, that he knew the science in the book was mumbo jumbo. That he, unlike other, uh, he used that phrase. Um, unlike other science fiction authors, or many other science fiction authors, he wasn't really that interested in the technical side of things. There was a trend in science fiction, and to some extent, it's still there. But a lot of early science fiction authors had a background in science. And, the, and engineering and things like that. And so they were very interested in the technical aspects of how would you make this work and what inventions, you know, could we imagine that people might be using in a science fiction context. And so they were very into the technical side of things, which Lewis was not. Lewis was not interested in how does the science work and how does the technology work. He was obviously much more interested in ideas like um, social theory, you know, and ideologies and how it intersects with religion and things like that. So like when he does the classic speech translation, you know, at the climax of the book, that's, that's all, you know, kind of, that's not technical ideas, but it's social ideas and ideologies that he's deconstructing and critiquing and parodying. And so, you know, like there's the one moment where uh, I forget his name, but the gentleman makes this claim that life's claims are absolute. And in trying to translate it, Ransom says, I cannot say what this man is saying in your language, you know, because it's just so nonsensical. Um, so Lewis basically said, I'm just doing the science to satisfy me. Um, and so he, he made up stuff, uh, some of which are not actually that bad. Like he had the spaceship being transported by lesser known properties of sunlight Mm -hmm. And that's actually that's actually possible. Um, they they didn't really have the concept out there, as far as I'm aware, in in Lewis's day. But solar sails actually are, work. I mean, we've tested them, and you can make a starship or a spaceship move by solar power, just in terms of using light pressure from a star or a laser to push it along in space like wind pushing on the sail of an ocean-going vessel. And I don't know that Lewis envisioned a solar sail. Uh, I'm pretty sure he didn't in the book. But it is the idea that you could use light pressure for space transportation is a lesser-known property of sunlight. <laughs> and so you actually could build a ship that is powered by a lesser-known property of sunlight. Um, 
the one error now in making stuff up to satisfy him, that's fine. You know, an author can do that. But other people may have a different reaction to it. And what may strike you is, okay, this is plausible enough. This works for me. May strike someone else as, wow, that's really inaccurate. And, um, and the thing that really stands out to me from when I read it was the way gravity works in mm -hmm. interplanetary travel. And forgive me, like I said, because it's been so many years since I read this, but my memory is that when Ransom is being taken to Mars in the spaceship, they feel the gravity of Earth getting lesser and lesser, and then they reach a kind of equilibrium point, and then they feel the gravity of Mars pulling on them more and more as they approach the planet. Mm -hmm. That is not the way gravity works. <laughs> once you, once you, you don't have this smooth transition. Um, once you get off of Earth, you're in a microgravity environment, and the effects of Earth's gravity on on you after you've achieved escape velocity are going to be minimal. And you're not really going to feel Martian gravity until you get to Mars and are, you know, down in the atmosphere or landed or something like that. You're you're going to feel microgravity for the vast bulk of that trip. And 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 so it it may have, you know, thinking about gravity in this way may have felt natural to Lewis. And it, he was writing in 1937, so nobody had been in orbit at this point. They no, there were no astronauts in 1937, so nobody had actually felt what it's like and then come back and talked about it. I, I think a, an actual scientist could have told you because we've had Newton's, you know, um, gravitational equations since the 1600s. So you could have worked this out, and I'm sure people had worked this out. But it hadn't penetrated popular consciousness enough to reach Lewis, and so he imagined something else. And growing up in the space age, it's like, oh, no, that's not how microgravity works at all. And so it <laughs> leapt out at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a suspicion that he was also uh, digging into the more philosophical idea of planets exerting an influence. So Thulkandra, mm -hmm. Earth being the fallen planet, and Malakandra being uh, the planet related to Mars and warfare. Um, asserting their influence as they near them. Yeah, and that's another aspect of what Lewis is doing here, because Lewis was a classicist to a significant degree, and so he was very aware of ideas about planets that people had in the past, including their astrological influences. Um, and he's drawing in the Space Trilogy on certain astrological ideas that he's reworking, uh, but having the idea that, okay, planets have an influence on us, here on Earth, and that includes Mars, although he subverted expectations when it comes to Mars, because Mars in classical astrology is thought of as being a disruptive influence that can signal war and ambition and things like that. And so he populates it with three races that get along great and don't have wars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I also don't think it's an accident that in the sequel, which we will be doing not this coming season, but the one after that in Paralandra, Lewis basically discards any pretense at science, and he just yeah. has a, a glass coffin that takes him to the, to the planet. Mm -hmm. And I, one, I spoke to one scholar who um, has gone through all of Lewis's brother's diaries, Warney Lewis, mm -hmm. and Warney was commenting uh, about, I think it was an H.G. Wells work, and he said when the author started speaking about how 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 this doodad worked he described it as a tiresome interruption in an otherwise first class story he says i don't i don't want i don't care i don't want to know how it worked all that matters is that it did um and i think uh, by the time that lewis decides to go to paralandra he's just ah, magic coffin that'll do it <laughs> yeah one of the things that did occur to me as i was rereading it this time was how if you went to another planet with other creatures that followed a different de developmental path, there's actually no guarantee that you would even physically be able to speak their language just Correct. because your vocal cords and all of the other apparatus wouldn't be the same. And there is actually even a hint of that in the text when uh, uh, Hoy says something that he's just not able to reproduce. Yeah, um, and that's quite true. There, If you think about it, just here on Earth, and you think about all the different creatures that exist here on Earth and the sounds that they make, very few of them make sounds that are like humans. 
and they have different vocal tracks and other body parts besides vocal tracks that they use to make sounds, you know, like crickets are rubbing their legs together and stuff. Um, and, and very few things sound like us and we sound like very few other things. You know, as a human, I could say woof, but I don't really sound like a dog. You know, <laughs> that's, that's just a human approximation of the sound, or I could say bark and that's not really the way dogs sound. Um, we do a little better with cats. Meow kind of sounds like a cat a little more anyway. Um, very few creatures sound like humans. Some of them are able to make a single human-like sound, like uh, the Australian species of lyrebird can sound just like a screaming human baby. It's uncanny. It's just like, wow, this is like a screaming, crying baby. You would think that that's what it is if you didn't know you're listening to a lyrebird. Um, but very few have a, a, a range of sounds that overlaps with ours significantly. For example, chimpanzees don't. Um, even though they're our closest relatives, they don't sound like us. They can make some hooting sounds, but they don't have the the kind of vocal track needed to produce human-like sounds, which is why, even though there were some early efforts to try to teach them to speak, um, they switched over to trying to use sign language because they have better motor dexterity in their hands than a vocal track able to communicate in a human way. There are a few creatures that do, uh, you know, certain birds do like, um, you know, parrots are famous for being able to reproduce human like sounds and say Polly want a cracker or whatever they hear around them. And some of them are actually intelligent enough to, um, to be able to understand what they're saying to a significant degree, um, even though it's something they've never heard before. They're able, they may not understand what they're saying exactly the way a human would, but they're able to put together different words that they've learned that they know the meaning of. My favorite example from that of that is actually from a parapsychological study that was being done to test whether a particular parrot, I forget the species of parrot, but whether it could pick up thoughts from its owner who it had a strong bond with. And what they did was in this apartment building, they had they left the parrot in the apartment where it lived. They put the owner in a different apartment, so cut off from contact with the parrot. Then they showed the owner um, on a monitor images that the parrot knew words for. So like the parrot knew the word car, and so they'd show the owner a picture of a word car, and meanwhile they're monitoring the speech of the parrot and what it's saying, if anything, while the owner is looking at a picture of a car or a picture of an umbrella or whatever the, the parrot knew the words for. And they found that the parrot did have statistically higher than random chance correlation with what the owner was looking at, but they were strict in their scoring. And so if the parrot didn't use the word that was associated with the picture, they didn't count it as a hit. But one of the pictures they showed was of a picture of a person driving a car and they're sticking their head out the window and, and looking, you know, they've got their head out the window, they're looking down in front of the car and the parrot did not say the word car. What the parrot said was, careful, you stuck your head out. <laughs> and it's, wow, okay, careful, you stuck your head out is probably not a phrase the parrot has used to hearing. But it corresponds with what was in the picture, and it sounds like something the parrot formulated on its own, suggesting a high degree of comprehension of what those words mean. Wow, I'm now really scared of parrots. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the idea of them reading my mind. <laughs> well, they shouldn't shouldn't be much of a threat. Fortunately, parrots have significant limitations, which is why we capture them instead of the reverse. Ah, that makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. Well, now that we've got uh, the science and parapsychology covered, let's pivot mm -hmm. and talk about theology. Okay. So... Lewis addresses some of the theological implications of alien life on other planets in an essay that he wrote called Religion and Rocketry. But what do you think are the implications, particularly for Christianity, if we do find that there's life on other worlds? 
Well, um, I think that it's unknowable at this point, but I don't think there's any particular. Um, I don't think there's any particular threat here because um, we've met other intelligences that we didn't know about before. Um, you know, for millennia, all most people in Europe knew about was Europe and Africa and Asia and what we today would call the old world. And there were even debates about could there be people at the antipodes, you know, on the other side of the world whose feet, the soles of their feet point towards the soles of our feet. And it was commonly thought that the answer was no, because how would they get there? They wouldn't be descended from Adam, so they wouldn't be people and so forth. And um, and as a result, you had a, a com- kind of a common opinion was there isn't anybody at the antipodes. And then it turned out there was. And we met them, and they weren't Christian, but that didn't destroy Christianity. They just, you know, they had various ideas about God and the gods, and some of their ideas were accurate, and others of their ideas weren't. So if we take the discovery of the new world here on Earth as a historical precedent, we could have something similar happen in the future. We might find aliens who, on, on additional new worlds, who they might be they might have a religion that's like Christianity or Judaism, in which case, you know, God may have been revealing himself to, uh, to them the way he did to us. They might not have that, uh, but it wouldn't be any more of an intrinsic threat to Christianity than the discovery of Native Americans was, or the discovery of other cultures here on earth were. Um, they may have some theological ideas that are correct and others that are incorrect, and it's going to be a matter of working through them. They might be fallen or unfallen or fallen so hard that they're like demons. They might be softly fallen. They, they, God might have, um, if, if they're fallen, God might have secured their redemption in a different way than he did with us. You mentioned with the opening quote, you know, would Jesus have gone and died for them on their planet? And that's possible. Um, that's been picked up in various science fiction, including the Star Trek episode, Bread and Circuses, where they, they, in the original series, they go to a planet where Rome has continued to the 20th century. So they're putting gladiator matches on television and stuff like that. And they keep hearing references to sun worshipers. And they're puzzled by that because they are, um, they're, they're not aware of prominent sun worshipers in Rome at the, uh, you know, in ancient Rome, of course there were. I mean, Apollo was a major deity, um, but uh, they're puzzled about this, these references they keep hearing to sun worshippers who were kind of lower class and persecuted and stuff. And then at the end of the episode, Lieutenant Uhura, who's been monitoring their their radio broadcasts, says, "Oh, it's not the sun in the sky; it's the son of God," implying that Jesus had been to their planet too and started Christianity there. Um, and that's just on TV science fiction, but there have been science fiction books that have that as a premise of Jesus is moving from planet to planet, redeeming people. And that's possible, but it's also possible, as Aquinas points out, that God could redeem us in any way he chose. So it might not involve the death of the Son of God, it might involve something else. So I think there are loads of possibilities, and we can't really say much about the possibilities until we meet them and find out what they're like and figure out how their beliefs about religion, if any, intersect with ours. Um, I did, incidentally, an episode of Mysterious World where I talked all about this. It's the central theme of the episode. Um, You know, what would it mean for Christianity if we discovered intelligent life? And if people want to listen to that, it's episode 55. So they could go to mysterious.fm slash 55 and listen to the Aliens and Religion episode, which, again, it's mysterious.fm slash 55. I'll make sure there's a link to that in the show notes. Awesome. And I do want to talk about fallenness and the Christian conception of it and Malachandra in a moment. But before that, Mm -hmm. if, if we did find life on other planets, do you think we should observe the prime directive from Star Trek? Non, non-interference, or even a more extreme version. Because in Religion and Rocketry, in that essay, Lewis suggests that he's often wondered whether or not our separation from any other intelligent life might be some, some kind of quarantine, as mm-hmm. we hear explicitly described in Out of the Silent Planet. 
Well, um, so there's a, a actually a short track featuring Mr. Spock and Number One, and it's like Mr. Spock's first day on the Enterprise, and he's talking to the first officer, Number One, and he says to her, "Has it ever occurred?" She's demanded that she, that he ask him her questions. So kind of as a rite of hazing, he's being expected to ask her question after question after question. And um, and one of his questions is, has it ever occurred to you that the prime directive is nonsensical and possibly morally problematic? And she says, never say that again if you want to progress in Starfleet. Because <laughs> there are bunches of problems with the prime directive as understood in in Star Trek. I think the um, a much more realistic approach is the one taken in Stargate, where we've got interaction. It's not unlimited. We we don't give everybody our high tech, but we do some, we don't have this, we must never affect them in any way ethic. I think if we found actual aliens, what we should do is dependent on who they are. Um, I agree with Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, that we shouldn't really be advertising our existence to aliens because if they're intelligent, they're probably like us, meaning they eat meat and they have a background as hunters evolutionarily. That's why, for example, humans have eyes that face the front instead of the side because if you are a hunter, you need triangulation to figure out how, how far away your prey is so that you can estimate your leap and so forth or how far you need to throw the spear. If you're an herbivore, you need eyes to the side so you can watch for hunters. And so that's why herbiv herbivorous animals like cows and horses have side-mounted eyes and predators like humans and lions and, and wolves have front-mounted eyes. And being a predator tends to be associated with intelligence because you need intelligence to sneak up on your prey, but you don't need intelligence to sneak up on a blade of grass. <laughs> so, it, so intelligence is associated with being a predator, and any aliens that we find that are intelligent are likely to have a predatory evolutionary history as well. And that means they're fellow members of the Predators Club. Now, you may notice predators here on Earth tend to have kind of a, a, a membership privilege. If you're in the Predator Club, other predators are going to think twice before attacking you. Um, you know, that's why we don't just go out and, you know, randomly attack bears and lions and stuff like that. If we go out hunting, we tend to go after game animals that are, are tend to be herbivorous. And the same thing is true of other predators, um, because we're all dangerous and you don't want to mess with something that's dangerous. And so, um, so if we find extraterrestrials that are intelligent and they're more advanced than us, I don't want to advertise our existence to them. Uh, I don't want to be saying, hey, we're here, come visit. Um, <laughs> because it tends not to go well when you have cultures meeting at different levels. The technologically superior culture tends to overwhelm the the lesser culture. So I would advocate isolation from uh, from more advanced aliens um, and only very slowly open up to actually having contact with them after a long period of observing them and getting ourselves up to speed so we could match them in a fight, if it came to that. If we meet aliens that are less advanced than us, then I wouldn't say use Star Trek's prime directive, but I would say use the same kind of protocols that anthropologists use in dealing with less technologically advanced cultures. You don't want to come in and just overwhelm them. But that also doesn't mean you have no contact with them. Instead, you do a, you, you do a kind of limited contact thing where you try to respect and protect their culture from being destroyed, um, but you, you, you are able to interact, and you can even embed anthropologists to study their culture and so forth. So I would say we already have at least models of the kind of of the kinds of protocols we would want for interaction with extraterrestrials at least tentatively 
we'd have to modify those based on who we actually find and what their psychology is like. Um, because thus far, we only have the psychology of humans and other Earth creatures to look to. But I can imagine things, um, you know, aliens that are intelligent and have non-human psychologies that might mandate a change in how we work. For example, I have an idea for a science fiction story I, might, I may write someday where um, we encounter aliens whose psychology, they're intelligent and they're technological, but and they're more advanced than us, but their uh, psychology is like that of chimpanzees. So if you imagine an intelligent, technologically more advanced than us species that is as hyper excitable as chimpanzees and has the same territorial instincts that chimpanzees do. Like the, the first contact in this story is going to be the, they discover us. And the first thing they do to stake out their territory and prove that we need to respect them is they destroy Pluto. You know, just they use a mass driver and Bam! Pluto is shattered just to show us that we need to respect them. Or, and, or maybe just to end the argument as to whether or not Pluto is a planet. It doesn't matter well, anymore. It's gone. In, in, in my universe, Pluto is justly recognized as the planet it is. If something's right. big enough to be round and not big enough to glow, it's a planet, including our sister planet, the moon. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, there we go. We we have we have our policy going forward in our intergalactic travel. At least uh, those would be my proposals, but no one listens to me, so it won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do think you make some very good points, particularly if that these other races are fallen, and that's mm-hmm. that's really where, where I want to go now. Um, I want to speak about Malachandra, but before we get there, one passage that I often hear mentioned in relation to fallenness is um, is, tr- is trying to tease out the uh the ripples of the fall basically how wide was it was there death before the fall and in romans paul speaks about all of creation groaning groaning um mm-hmm. yeah now if all of creation is groaning does that mean that therefore uh, a singular fall of our first parents affected all the entire cosmos meaning that any other planets which had alien life that they would necessarily be fallen as well. It's gonna. There's no way to to provide a definite answer to that question uh, because we don't know what it pertains to creatures on other planets. Um, there have been a range of opinions regarding how the fall affected things here on Earth. Um, I would side with Thomas Aquinas and say if you if you number well okay so number 1 and Aquinas didn't say it this way but the text of early genesis is not straight history mm-hmm. it is written in a figurative way that communicates theological truths um you know like god made all this stuff but it's not a chronology a literal chronology of how god made all this stuff And the second creation account in Genesis 2 and 3, I think, is similar. And the Catechism acknowledges that that Genesis contains, you know, uh, figurative language, especially in its early chapters. And that doesn't mean it's all a myth, it doesn't mean it's all a parable, but it's not straight history and straight science. And in, science hadn't even been invented in the modern sense in, when, when Genesis was written about 1000 BC. So we wouldn't expect it to be a scientific document. Um, but I would, even if you treat it as if it is fully literal, we see that the universe is, entro- is entropic before the fall. It's already subject to entropy because without entropy, stars don't shine. And the stars start shining on day four. And without entropy, you don't got to eat. But God gives Adam and Eve permission to eat of every tree of the garden except one. So um, so we already see that the universe is subject to entropy, which is the tendency to go from a high energy, high organization state to a low energy, low organization state so that systems run down and break down over time. Um We also see that there's death before the fall, because if you eat a piece of fruit, it dies. 
and that your your stomach acid is going to take it apart. It's not going to be a living piece of fruit anymore when you get done with it. So we already see death in place and entropy in place in the world prior to the fall, even if you take the text fully literally. Well, Aquinas uh, looked at the text and said, okay, um, did animals change their nature when man fell? You know, did lions eat grass rather than antelopes before the fall? And you look at what the text says, and it, it talks about humans falling, and it talks about humans are going to die. You know, God tells Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of this tree, you shall die. He's not talking about lions, He's not or tigers, or bears. He's talking about humans. And so Aquinas said, um, you know, the natural tendency of every system—he didn't have the word entropy, but he had the concept. He said the natural tendency of any, na- uh, of any system, any physical system, is to corrupt over time, because it's—we today would say because it's subject to entropy, unless it's supported by grace. And that would be true of us, too. Because we we're, we have we have we have bodies, they're physical systems. Their natural tendency is going to be to corrupt over time, unless they're supported by grace, which Adam and Eve had available to them in the form of the tree of life. But then, when they lost access to the tree of life, they lost access to the grace that could keep their their physical systems alive, and so they became subject to death. And this all only happened to humans. This did not happen to animals. And so Aquinas' opinion, and I agree, and it's also what the paleontological record would suggest, is that there there was animal death before the fall. What what came with the human fall was human death, because we were an exception. God had made had give us given us what theologians sometimes referred to as an elevated nature that went beyond what just natural forces would do with us. And then we lost that. When it comes to St. Paul's statement uh, about all of creation groaning, um, well, he's thinking of things here on earth. He's, he's not thinking about Vulcans, because <laughs> he doesn't know about Vulcans. He doesn't even know, St. Paul doesn't know, in all likelihood, that stars are other suns, because that was not a common view in the ancient world. Under Aristotelian science, which Paul would have learned, um, the, the, the universe is a series set, centered on Earth. It's a series of concentric shells that revolve around the Earth, and the sphere of the fixed stars is it's, it's, it's like a big sphere that has these little lights on it, And that's all they are, is little lights. And this sphere, the outer sphere of the fixed stars, is just beyond the orbit of Saturn. And so that's the cosmological image that St. Paul has in mind. He's not thinking about alien creatures on other planets light years away. He doesn't have those concepts. And so what he's talking about is the creation as he knows it, which is here on Earth. And it's obviously not literally true that all of creation is groaning. Because the stars aren't groaning, the moon isn't groaning, the tree next door is not groaning. Um, so what kind of creation is groaning? Well, I think, it's, I think what St. Paul means is human creation. He's using a, um, a mode of speech where it, it's sort of the reverse of a pars pro toto. A pars pro toto is where you have a part that you refer to as a way of referring to the whole. So I could say, for example, all hands on deck. Well, I don't mean everyone put your hands on the deck. I mean, everyone who has hands come up on deck now. I'm using the term hands as a part to refer to the whole person. And what I think St. Paul is doing is the reverse of that, sort of a toto pro pars. Um, where he is referring to everything as a way of referring specifically to humanity. All of humanity is groaning under the influence of original sin until, and waiting anxiously, until the revelation of the sons of God. So, um, so that's how I take St. Paul on all that. So I don't think we can infer anything from Scripture uh, about what the conditions— uh, may be for aliens and whether they're all fallen or all unfallen or some mix. Um, the I think we can speculate, 
And one possible speculation is that Adam and Eve were not only the federal heads of the human race, but the federal heads of all intelligent biological life. And if that happened, if that was the case, then every race and every intelligent race in the universe fell when our race fell. However, I think that's, even though it's possible and I can't rule it out because we don't have the data we need to rule it out, I think it's unlikely. You'll notice I had to throw in the word biological intelligent, the word biological into biological intelligent life, because God has made other intelligent creatures, the angels, mm -hmm. and they're intelligent, but they're not biological. And what happened with them? Well, like us, they were given an option about are they going to serve God or not? And some of them took the option to serve God, and some of them didn't, which is different than what happened with our race. Our race rejected the option of serving God, and we all fell as a result. Um, so what we see from this is at least, and now we've got a really small data set here in an experiment this would be n equals 2, um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the number of test cases is only two, but we see that in the two test cases, they're both given an option to serve God or not, and when, and when some of them rejected the option, different things happened. Angels are not biologically reproductive, so each angel is created independently of all the other angels. There's no organic connection between them, and some of them fell and some of them didn't because they each exercise the option individually. But humans are biologically related, and when the root of our race went bad, it affected all of their descendants. And, of course, we reproduce biologically. So, that you know, if it's like if you're a parent and you're Homer Simpson and you are playing with glowing green radioactive rods, even though actually fission looks blue rather than green, um you're going to damage your genes and your kids are going to have, you know, bright yellow skin, bulging eyes and huge overbites. Um, and so, you know, with us, when our par first parents fell, it, they damaged themselves and that damage rippled to all their descendants. So um, what would other races be like? Well, it could, it could be either of these models or something else. Uh, but given that God gave both the angels an option and us an option, my suspicion is that I think it's more probable that God would give every intelligent race an option, because what he cares about most is love. You know, that those, that's the two great commandments, love God, love your neighbor. So it's obvious God's number one priority is love, and he seems to want freely chosen love, and so that seems, if, if love is his first priority, and he wants love freely chosen rather than just pro loving behavior programmed into us, then that would suggest he's going to give a free option to every intelligent race he creates to either love him or not, and then it's going to be up to them what they do with it. Hmm. But then what actually makes a race, hmm. a planet, a people fallen? Because on Malacandra, we, we've, we've argued this mm -hmm. back and forth. Well, it's ma mainly okay. Matt and Andrew have argued, and I've sat back and mm -hmm. laughed. Uh, but uh, I, I'd love to get your take on this. Because on Malacandra, we see that obvious sinful behavior it seems to be mm -hmm. pretty rare. We hear stories, oh, I heard somebody once that wanted two mates. Someone started eating soil. Basically what they call bent behavior. It seems to be very yeah. rare, mostly relegated to stories. Actually, the, um, but it actually, the, to... actually, the eating dirt is not really bent behavior. Um, this is another scientific error on Lewis's part. Oh. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah. Lay it on me. So, so um, there's a, a wonderful book. What, what is it called again? Um, oh, it's been so long. It's been a few years since I've read it. Uh, but there's a book about parasites. And 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 uh, how they work and how they interact with humans and it's absolutely fascinating um, and gross. Uh, I used it as the basis <laughs> of an episode of of Mysterious World on mind control parasites. 
because there are parasites that will affect your mental function. And so these are mm. mind control parasites. And they'll get you to behave in certain ways um, so that you serve their interests. Um, you know, back in the day, I when I worked in the Catholic Answers office every day, some Sometimes people would come in and they're hacking and sneezing and stuff and they're going, don't worry, I'm not infectious. And I'm going, the germs make you say that. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. Germs do make you say that. Um, there was actually a study done of, of uh, the flu. And it's, it's happened with other diseases too, where doctors have noted that People who have caught this disease engage in the behavior that's designed to spread it. And, and they said, well, and they noticed it in particular with AIDS. Um, when someone is in the end stages of HIV infection, they start having this impulse to go out and do spreading behavior for AIDS. Um, but you can't do a test with AIDS. You can't deliberately give people AIDS to study what it's going to do. But you could give them, and, and you really can't even ethically give them the flu. But what you can ethically do is give them the flu vaccine. And so if you yeah. give someone a live flu vaccine and then observe their behavior, what they found is, you know, it takes a few days for, for it to ramp up in your system and so forth, which corresponds to the period of maximum infectability if they'd been given a bigger dose. Mm -hmm. um, but they're only given a small dose of a live vaccine. And But at the peak of when they would be most infectious, wallflowers are going out to parties and suddenly they're not staying <laughs> home anymore. And, and so actually the flu is a mind control virus that is designed to get you to engage in behavior to spread it. Um, so... What about eating dirt? Well, it turns out that various things help combat parasites. Among those things are spices. And that's why in the equatorial uh, band around the world, down near the equator, you look at the cultures down there, they've got spicy diets. They're adding spices to their foods be, without realizing it. They've cultivated a taste for the spices. But biologically, what it's doing is helping them fight the parasites that are endemic in the equatorial zone around the earth. Well, what about eating dirt? Well, same thing. There are minerals in dirt that will, and clay and things like that, that will help you fight parasites. And so children sometimes get an impulse to eat dirt and pregnant women who have a compromised immune system sometimes get an impulse to eat dirt and it's actually performing a valid biological function for them. So this was another error, not it. Well, I can't say about Martian biology, you know, but, <laughs> um, but the concept that Lewis is working with here is a little scientifically out of date. I'll put it that way. Um, actually, eating dirt is not necessarily bent behavior. It actually may be appropriate in some cases. Wow. I never knew that. <laughs> I'm looking at this very differently <laughs> now. Uh, I'm also never going to trust anyone if they've got the flu. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, let's box that stay, aside. Stay home until you're better. That's the solution. <laughs> <laughs> always good advice i'm i'm now part of a, a large family so there's always some child uh, sniffing and mm. wiping his nose on the furniture yeah uh, but returning to para mm. uh, no not paralandra melacandra uh, yeah we know that there is death people die although they seem to die at a very predictable time uh, mm -hmm. and rates so of people generations naturally die together and, and they sense when it's when it's near um but there is also um a predator or malacandra there's the hanacra mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. they hunt and it hunts them and towards the end of the book we learn that satan has attacked malacandra in the past and it mm -hmm. does seem that he managed to sway some of the inhabitants to sin mm -hmm. but the guardian angel effectively of the planet casts satan out and mm -hmm. uh, those who are under his sway he either he describes them as being cured or unbodied so some kind of redemption or, or they were killed um, yeah so with a all Martian that Inquisition. <laughs> Nobody expects it, even on Mars. <laughs> uh, so with all of that, 
how would you describe Malacandra? Would you say it's fallen, unfallen, or I, I liked your, your phrase earlier, softly fallen? Yeah, I would put it in that category. Um, I don't think the existence of a predator tells us anything about its state of fallenness, because I agree with Aquinas, predators existed and preyed on Earth before the fall um, of man. I also don't think that the death of the life forms um, tells us anything, because as Aquinas says, and I'm not a Thomist, but I think Aquinas is right on this, um, the tendency of every natural system is to corrupt over time, to break down. And that would have happened to us unless God had given us the option to uh, keep on living through the tree of life. And so I would say, okay, he just didn't give them the equivalent of a tree of life, you know, but he's letting the otherwise consequences of nature that you would expect happen to them. What is more significant to me in terms of this is the fact that Hoy, um acknowledges bentness in his race. And you you, you kind of have a, there's sort of two ways to look at that. Either Hyoi is correct that there's bentness in his race, in which case his race has fallen, or Hyoi is incorrect about bentness in his race, in which case he's bent. And so uh, he, he at least has bent judgment. And so, um, so I think either way you go, there's some bentness in their race. But they don't seem to be near as bad as we are. So I would say they are lightly fallen or softly fallen or something like that. They fell. They just didn't fall as hard as we did. And similarly, they, we didn't fall as hard as angels did. You know, um, angels, once they made the ones that went bad, once they went bad, they, they're, they're like the little girl with the little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When angels are good, they're very, very good. And when they're bad, they're horrid. <laughs> and so they, the angels, the ones that fell, fell even harder than we did. The um, cross just didn't fall as hard as we did. That would be my take based on the data in the novel. And I really like that, and I really like the conclusion that you've reached, because I would say mm. the consensus of, of our co-hosts is certainly in that direction. Uh -huh. uh, but bef before we wrap up, uh, I've got to ask you the big question. Do you think there's extraterrestrial life out there? And do you think they've ever visited us? Mm, intelligent or non-intelligent life? Or both? I'm going to say intelligent. Okay, I'll give you the, the both answer for free. Um, I, th I, I, think there, I think there very probably is life out there, at least non-intelligent life, and I think it probably exists in our own solar system. In fact, I did a pair of episodes of Mysterious World that I really should recommend to your audience because it intersects directly with the themes of the book um, that y'all have just read. I did a two-part two episode on um, life on Mars. In part one, I talked about the history of thought about life on Mars and Percival Lowell and all that, and that's episode 179. You can go to mysterious.fm slash 179 and listen to that. And then the next week in part two, I came back and said, what's the scientific evidence for life on Mars? And so that's episode 180. It's mysterious.fm slash 180 if you want to go directly to it. And the evidence is really good for there being primitive life on Mars. I mean, surprisingly really good. Um, in fact, when the, um, when the Viking probes did the tests back in the 1970s, they got a positive result. And then the higher-ups at NASA did a post hoc change of the criteria for life detection so that mm. they could say, nah, actually not. Um, but since then... There has been a continuing stream of new evidence that also supports that conclusion. So I think that I think there's a really good chance that there actually is primitive life on Mars. The question would be, how did it get there? Because um, it could have been created there, it could have evolved there, or it could have come from somewhere else, like Earth. 
because we know we've got Martian meteorites on Earth. You know, where a chunk of Mars's surface got blown off into space and eventually it found it way, its way here. Well, there are also going to be Terran meteorites on Mars from the same thing. Part little chunks of Earth's crust get knocked off in an impact. They float around the solar system. And some of them are going to land on Mars. And here on Earth, we know we've got life. And some of that life is extremophile, meaning it exists in and continues to live in very extreme environmental conditions, including vacuum and and extremely cold temperatures and things like that. So I think it's quite possible that um, it's possible life got started here on Earth and then a chunk of Earth's surface gets knocked off into space with an impact. It's got extremophile bacteria in it. They continue to survive in the heart of some rock. This rock eventually lands on Mars, and it starts spreading from there now that it's back in a more congenial environment. It could also go the other way around. It could have started on Mars and come here. It could have started somewhere else. Right now, there are scientists who are seriously looking at the possibility of life on, for example, Jupiter in the oceans, the water oceans, uh, or other oceans that are on Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. So there are multiple habitable places, it would seem, in our own solar system. And if life appears in any one of them, it can spread to all the others. So given that we have life here and it can spread to multiple other habitable zones in our own solar system, I think it's very probable that primitive life exists elsewhere. And that some of that primitive life came here and visited us. If life got started on Mars, it could have hitched a ride on one of the Martian meteorites. So it could be microbial aliens here now or in the past. <laughs> um, when it comes to intelligent life, well, I, I, it's harder to say because intelligent life is harder to come up with. You know, it, it, it's only happened so far as we know, unless the Silurian hypothesis is true, it's only happened once in the 4.5 billion year history of our planet that God put intelligent life here. So, um, so it's and and in fact, for most of the history of Earth, life was microbial. It, it, it's really only been in the last you know Earth is 4.5 billion years old. It's really only been less than a billion years that we've had multicellular life. So you have this extremely long period of microbial life, and then it starts. You start to get multicellular organisms, and then whoosh, you get, you know, dinosaurs and humans and all that stuff. Um, so, in, and intelligence just at the end of that. So I think that it, intelligent life is going to be rarer than non-intelligent life, but. Given how big the universe is and how many billions and trillions of stars and planets there are out there, my suspicion, and if I had to bet, which I don't have to, but if I had to bet, I would bet that, yeah, there's probably intelligent life out there. Hmm. Has it visited us? Because I, I, and part of that is theological, you know, I, I, I mean, I can imagine, and it's obvious God has made a really big universe, most of which is not filled with life, but we know he's interested in intelligences because he's created more than us. I mean, we also know for a fact about the angels and if he's made us and if he's made angels and he's got a huge, enormous universe, my guess is he's got some other biological intelligences elsewhere in the huge, enormous physical universe. Have they come here? I don't know. I'm open to that possibility. I'm not convinced of the possibility. There are ways that even with slower than light travel, there have been estimates done. You know, you can use robotic probes and stuff to do this. You could effectively map and, co and colonize a galaxy in about a million years. So if there are intelligent life forms elsewhere in our galaxy and they're, they've been intelligent for a million years or more, they very well could have reached us just by slower than light, by probes and stuff like that. Um, and if they're a million years ahead of us technologically, they may have faster than light. Um, there are solutions that allow for faster than light travel under Einstein's general relativity. And we even have, you know, the principles 
and kind of prototype designs, not a functional prototype, but we have principles for faster than light travel, like the Alcubierre warp drive, which uses a loophole in Einstein's um, theory of relativity to, even though objects with mass can't travel faster than the speed of light, that restriction does not apply to space. Space can travel faster than the speed of light. And in fact, it does so in relative terms. There's a cosmic horizon where, you know, the farther out in space you get, the faster things are moving away from us because of the Hubble constant. And um, there is a point you reach where they're, in relative terms, they're moving away from us faster than the speed of light. So there's a cosmic horizon. Every year, more stars fall over that horizon and we'll never see them again because now they're too far away for their light to reach us. And so given that space is not subject to the light speed limit, you could move a patch of space from one place to another faster than light by contracting the space in front of it and expanding the space behind it. And that's the principle of the Alcubierre warp drive. And so, and that's just one solution. So if you talk to, phys to, to physicists who've studied this question, uh, and it's not just Alcubierre, it's other people like Michio Kaku and Sabina Hassenfelder and other people, they'll say, well, we can't build one today, but it may very well be possible for us one day to build a faster than light travel mechanism. And if you got a million years head start on us, aliens could have already done that and could be visiting us faster than light. So I think it's possible that intelligent life is visiting us, but given, and given the UFO cases that I've studied, I am open to some of them being extraterrestrial, but I'm not convinced of that. There are other explanations as well, and so I'm, when it comes to the visiting question for intelligent life, I'm open, but not persuaded at this point. Hmm. And in another piece of serendipity, uh, your mm -hmm. co-worker Trent Horn, in his uh, mm -hmm. podcast today, he was talking about generational travel. So that we all jump on a spaceship, and we start heading for the nearest uh, inhabitable planet, and several generations will live and die on that ship. And then yep. that would be one way of doing some colonization. That's one way of slower than light travel between star systems, uh, generation ships. Uh, there are other possibilities too, um, not all of which would be in accord with Catholic moral theology, but um, that's not going to stop the Chinese. Um, and you could have um, you could have embryos or gametes in storage that you then thaw out and, and grow grow once you get to the destination, just for example. Or you could print them. You know, you got a got a cellular printer, you print up a new totipotent stem cell and turn it into a baby when you get to your destination. <laughs> and as the father of a small child, I'll say when he becomes a toddler, he'll then just destroy everything. <laughs> <laughs> You'd want Jimmy some Aiken. robot Thank nannies. Exactly. That's what I need. Jimmy Aiken, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. As the landlord rings the bell for final drinks, can you tell people where they can find out more about you and listen to episodes specifically of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World? Yeah, so um, the uh, I work for Catholic Answers in San Diego. Our website is catholic.com, and you can hear more about me there as well as our other activities, our other apologists. Um, my personal website is jimmyakin.com, which I use as a kind of hub for my online activities. Um, I'm on various podcasts, and in particular, I want to highlight Mysterious World because it intersects with the themes we've been talking about today. Every Friday, we look at a new mysterious subject. We look at them through the twin perspectives of faith and reason. What would reason tell us about this? What would the faith tell us about this? And we're, we're open-minded but critical. So we're not going to just dismiss everything like some shows. We're not, we're not, you know, hardcore disbelievers in mysteries, but we're also not super credulous. We're going to use critical thinking. And unlike a lot of mystery-related pod, podcasts and shows, we actually try to solve the mysteries. It, we, we're not just generating wonder. Imagine what if. 
and said, <laughs> we're actually trying to find out what's true. And we'll, we'll make a list. We'll present the background on a mystery. We'll make a list of things that could explain it, starting with the natural explanations. Then we'll go through them and say, well, how well do these, nat do these explanations fit the data? And sometimes we get it down to one explanation or just a few explanations, but we try to solve them to the extent possible. Um, we cover natural mysteries, supernatural mysteries, scientific mysteries, paranormal mysteries. If it's mysterious, it's interesting. And uh, uh, we have, we're typically a top 20 documentary podcast in the U.S. on Apple Podcasts. We've got over 100,000 listeners every week. And so check it out. The home, you know, it's in Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Stitcher and all that. Um, so it's in all the standard podcast directories. It's also its home page is mysterious.fm, like the radio. So mysterious.fm. It you can also go to my YouTube channel where we have a video version of it, and that's youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. Particular episodes that your audience might be interested in, given what we've talked about today, include episode fifty-five on in Intelligent Aliens and Theology, so that's Mysterious.fm slash 55, and also the two-parter on Life on Mars, which is episodes 179 and 180, so that would be Mysterious.fm slash 179 and Mysterious.fm slash 180. And we also have lots of other mysteries, including other extraterrestrial ones, so uh, if that kind of thing is of interest to you, check us out. And if you're interested in more terrestrial mysteries, uh, I really enjoyed today's episode on uh, the Masons. Leo Taxel, yeah, his startling Masonic revelations. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again to Jimmy Aiken for coming on the show. Thanks to our audio engineers, Taylor and Sarah. Thanks to all of our listeners, patron supporters, and particularly our top-tier supporters, Alex, James, Matt 1, 2, and 3, Erica, Marvin, Joel, Deborah, Amanda, Emmy, Thomas, Bill, Joanna, Bud, Shane, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Kelly, Chris, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. We pray for you all each week, uh, and particular attention is given to our prayer request channel. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please check out Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. And if you would like an opportunity to win the one of the t-shirts that I'm wearing, uh, please share this episode on social media and tag Pints with Jack. One person will be chosen at random, and you will get a t-shirt in your size. And please join us again next time, when Matt, Andrew, and I will be celebrating the season finale, when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. <laughs>